Good morning, everyone. So, in, uh, John 11, 25 and 26, we have, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life, and whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Let's stand and worship this morning. Lift up a shout of praise for the bridegroom will come. The glorious one. And oh, we will look on his face. And go oh, to a much better place. with all your might lift up your hands and clap for joy the time's drawing near when he will appear and oh we will stand by his side a strong pure spotless bride streets that are golden the glorious bride and the great son of man every tongue and tribe and nation will join in the song of the King, our groom is soon to appear. The wedding feast to come is now near at hand. Lift up your voice, proclaim the coming land. The coming land. We will dance on the street. will join in the song of the Lamb. We will dance on the streets that are golden, glorious bride and the great son of man. Every tongue and tribe and nation will join in the song of the Lamb. How 
beautiful things out of the dust. You make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of us. You make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of the dust. Thank you, praise team. That was great. Thank you guys in the back running the, the sound system. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Diane Cole. I've been asked to do the announcements this morning. So if you look on the back of your uh, bulletin, we've been highlighting the Sunday School program here. And last week, they talked quite a bit about the adult Sunday School program, which is wonderful. And the three classes you'll see are forgiveness, the feasts of the Lord, and the discipleship with Ray Vanderlaan. But I've been given the opportunity to specifically speak about the children's program. And so uh, children's Sunday School is really wonderful here for the younger children we're teaching the basic fundamental stories of the bible that their faith will be built on for the rest of their lives the upper elementary we're doing chronologically through the bible we're using the story and with an emphasis on seeing jesus in the old testament as well as god's attributes and character the middle school classes are doing um, the New Testament, and they focus specifically on a scripture verse to apply every week, and the high school kids are doing the Old Testament with Chaplain Smith. So I really want to encourage you to get your kids and get yourself involved in the Sunday school programs. We have great sermons here, and we have a wonderful children's church during this service, but Sunday school is really where we get the discussion. We get to hear each other ask questions and answer questions, and we're spurred one, one another on. Uh, that's how we grow spiritually, and I just think it's so important that our kids know who they are, that they are loved unconditionally by God, that the Word of God can be in their heart and available to them every moment of every day. So please, whatever your reasons have been for maybe not being involved in Sunday school in the past, I would just ask that you would please make that a priority and get yourselves and your kids involved in the program here. So thank you. Um, if you are new or if you have a prayer request, we have the little piece of paper on the side of the bulletin if you would just fill that out and you can put that in the offertory basket and if there's no other announcements let's have a time of greeting one another thank you
can find your way back to your seats. Let's continue worshiping. Psalm 33, verse 11, says this, But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of his heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. Please join me with a few moments of prayer. Lord, we heard your word just spoken. I pray, Lord, that we would be the nation, that we would be the church, that we would be the people whom you are your, our God, that we would look to you in all things, all the things that we're going through in life, the week we had last week, maybe even the morning we, we had just today. I ask, Lord, that you would be with us, that your Holy Spirit would come down, 
that it would walk with us and that we would walk with you, Lord. Lord, I ask that in any way we have fallen short that we would confess those things now. That we know and we believe in your word that you are a God who forgives, a God who restores, and a God who redeems. So I ask that we would lift our prayers to you now. That we know that we have forgiveness because of the blood your son has shed for us. Lord, I ask and pray that you would be with this church, that you would be with this chapel, our 8.30 and 11 o'clock services, all the volunteers, all the hands that are working to do what you have called us to do. And at times it seems that our efforts fall short, and they do. But we know and we believe that your plan stands firm that the trials in our lives and things that we are going through now, you have set before us to walk in them, to refine us by the fires and trials of life. And we know that we will come through the other side, new, stronger, more committed to you. Lord, we lift these things to you. I pray for Pastor Vineyard as he comes up here to preach your word, that it would be light to the blind, that we would hear your truth, that we would not walk away this morning without hearing it and being changed by it. Lord, we also lift these prayers to you. We give to you now, Lord, in the offering as obedient servants, that this money, that these things would go to your work in your kingdom, and that it would be used for your kingdom. Lord, we lift all these things to you. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Children are dismissed at this time for a children's church. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you again. I mean, I've been with you uh, a month and a half, two months. I think I shared a couple weeks ago, got to preach for you. Uh, I guess it's a good sign I got asked to, to preach again or, or not uninvited. So I, I'm back again. So good to, good to be with you. If you got your Bibles, uh, I'd invite you to John chapter 2. We're going to be in John chapter 2, particularly today, verses 1 through 11. I'll jump to chapter 20, verses 30 through 31 but uh, particularly John chapter 2, 1 through 11. Um, as you're turning there, um, I, I, I'll just ask, is anybody in here a problem solver? You, you like solving problems? All right, there's like two. All right, well, the rest of you, maybe the rest of you are like me. You'd rather not see a problem ever. Like, I don't, is anybody like that? Like, I'm not a problem, I don't want problems. All right, not that you guys like problems, but, you know, some people get into that. Like, they, they just like solving problems problems. Whether you like that, whether you're not, we, we know it. L life is full of problems, right? The, the mic today, right? Uh, you know, I mean, uh, the, the mic. We've got, we've got big problems. Uh, we've got, maybe call them small problems, first world problems. Um, the mic is a first world problem. I had one this week. Uh, I just put coolant in my car uh, a couple weeks ago, and then the engine was overheating, and I'm like, I think I have a coolant leak. And I, and I think I do. I think it's a slow leak. And that's a problem. But, but at the end of the day, right, it's not a huge problem, but, it, but it's still something we have to work with. So whether it's a smaller problem uh, or bigger problems, and there, there's some people that are dealing with some major issues, some health issues, some family issues. Uh, we, we all have problems to deal with. Um, I had a friend who years ago, he was, he was a chaplain, 
he played college football, and he relayed a story uh, from his football days, and, and he said uh, he had a problem, and, and his coach looked at him and he said, Tim, that was his name, your problem is not really your problem. Your problem is your perspective of your problem. Uh, let me say that again. Your problem is not really your problem. Your problem is the perspective of your problem. Uh, sometimes I think that's the case. Our problem isn't really the problem. The problem is, is, is how am I framing it? What's the perspective that I have? But let's be honest, sometimes our problem might be our problem because it's a big deal. Life is full of problems. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to look at a tax where there's a problem and we're going to see how they resolve it. There's a party uh, and, and you can see the title of the sermon, Life is a Party Until It's Not, right? I mean, because that, that's life. Everything is great until it's not. And that's what's going on in this text. And, 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 and I chose this text kind of praying through it. I don't know, maybe you see the Oktoberfest signs around, and so maybe that had something to do with it. The story is Jesus turns water into wine. So maybe that was an underlying, I don't know, I've seen the signs around, but John chapter 2 uh, verses 1 to 11, th there's, a, there's a party and there's a problem. So what I want to do is I, wanna, I just want to read the verses and then let's look at what they say, we'll talk about what they mean, and then maybe see how can we apply them to our lives today. So John chapter 2, verse 1 and following. It says, On the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus was also invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, I love his response, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification each holding 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some water out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water that had now become wine, and he did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn it knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. But when the people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first of his signs that Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Let's pray. Father, I pray now as we dive into this text a little bit that you would just open our hearts, open our minds for what you would speak to us. I pray that you would be honored and Lord, you'd continue the transformation process in each one of us that you're already working in and through us for your glory. It's in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Life is a party until it's not. All right, we jump into this text and there's a celebration. What's going on? It's a wedding, right? Weddings are fun. Weddings are exciting, and that's what was going on. There, there's a party going on, and we don't know why, but for whatever reason, they ran out of wine. Whether they miscalculated how much they would need, whether people showed up that were, were unexpected, we don't know the scenario. We do know this, they ran out of it. That's a big deal in the first century for a Jewish wedding. This is something you don't run out of. There's nothing really today like it, but you could imagine, like Amanda and I say, hey, we're going to have a good old, old-fashioned Thanksgiving. We're going to invite every family member from all over the United States, we're going to have them descend on our house, and we are going to have the greatest Thanksgiving ever. And so we do it, and then we run out of turkey immediately. People are like, you, how do you do that, right? I mean, and again, it's not exactly like that. This is to the next level. This is, a, this is an honor-shame culture, right? So it's a little different than our culture. This is an honor-shame culture. Where you run out of wine at something like this, this is very, very shameful. And so uh, they, they run out of wine. Now you may ask, why wine? Well, A, it's what they were drinking, right? It's what they had. But B, there's an Old Testament context to this. Wine in the Old Testament, you see over and over and over, represents life. It represents joy. 
Now, you've got to be cautious with it because there's a line where the Old Testament also talks about drunkenness, which is a no-go. But, but there's this idea of life and joy, which when you put together for a wedding, that's what's going on. It's this idea of life and joy. We're full of life and we're full of joy. And oh, by the way, we don't have any. And people would do, this doesn't even make sense conceptually. Life is a party until it's not. And, 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 and the, the family who runs the party, who's in charge, would immediately be struck and do, oh my gosh, what do we do? They start wringing their hands. They start, you know, they, they start asking, what, what, are we, what are we going to do? There is a problem in the text that they have no solution for. They don't have a solution for this. And, and so it reminds us, and, I would, and I'm going to come back to this point. There's a point in the text that I, I'll call it the micro point of this, ver, this text and the macro point of the book of John. And here's the point. Some problems require outside help. Some problems require outside help. In the text today, you see that. They have a problem that they don't have a solution for. I will make the argument, and I'll show it to you in just a minute. The book of John presents that as the macro problem of you and me. You have a problem that you do not have a solution for. We see it in the text, we see it across the book, and we'll, we'll look at both very, very quickly. Some problems we can solve on our own. My coolant problem, I kind of figured it out. Like, oh, I think I need to buy a bottle of coolant. And then I'm going to have to take it in and get a new hose and whatever. But there's other problems that are bigger than that, that I don't have a solution for. They're complex. Some authors call them wicked problems. There are these problems where we just, we don't, we don't have a solution for it. And here in the text... They've got a problem, and they don't have the solution for it. Who happens to be at the party? Jesus. Oh, he does, right? That guy does. And, and he was. He was at the party. Now, to be fair, they, whoever they is, the family running the party, they don't go up to Jesus. Who does? His mom, Mary. Now, what, 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 what does that mean? Well, we can insinuate a number of things. I think what it means is Mary's invited. So they know this family. They know the family. They've got an invitation. I think Mary is involved with party planning and preparation. That's an assumption. But she knows enough to know that she's got to go to Jesus. So she knows. She's talked to the family. She, she knows they're stressing out. And she comes to Jesus now. What's fascinating is, is there's a problem with her request to Jesus. And Jesus points it out. The interesting thing is, in the text, you can see Mary is not asking Jesus to fix the problem in a normal way. Hey, Jesus, you got a hundred bucks. I know you do. Go, go to 7-Eleven and get the one. Right. That's not what she's asking, is it? That's not how Jesus is at least taking it. She's not like, you've got extra change. Go get some wine. That's not what's going on. She knows Jesus can fix this in an interesting way. Call it supernatural. And the inference is that's what she's asking. Not you got more money than anybody else because he doesn't probably. You can fix it. Why would she say that? Why, why would she come to Jesus and say, I know you can fix this supernaturally. I'm adding that word, but that's the insinuation. Why would she say that? Who was there at the, at the Christmas story? She was. Who was there at the conception? She was. She knows that this, this son of hers is fully her son, and yet fully other. In fact, every Christmas, and we'll do it coming up as we build up to Christmas, where we've got an Advent series we're going to do, there's always a little verse that always strikes me, and it says, Mary treasured these things in her heart. It's like she observed them, she participated with them, and she stored them up and pondered them and processed them. Fast forward 33, 34, 35 years of processing and pondering, she sees a problem. She knows Jesus has a solution. And she comes and says, Jesus, fix this. You can do this fix this problem. Now, how, I, I noted it. I love Jesus' response. Woman, right? Like, what? Well, what do I have to do with this? This isn't my problem. I'm just here as a guest. 
woman, right? I, it's just funny how he, how he responds. And then what does he do? He gets to work. Now, there's not a lot of physical labor going on here. I don't know if you read the text. There's not a lot of labor going on here. But he gets to work. He looks over and he sees jugs. How many jugs does he see? What does it say in the text? Six. Here's the interesting thing. I think some symbolism is going on. You see, in the Jewish culture, six was an incomplete number. It was wrong. You're like, what? Think about it. God creates the world and rests in how many days? Seven. Why? In the Jewish mind, seven is the number of completeness, totality. Why do we have seven days in a week? Because God made it that way. Seven is the number of completeness. Six is a number of almost there. That's why the Antichrist is six, six, six. He's trying to be like the Trinity, but he's off. And here you look over here, and, and there's six jugs that are for what? What does it say in the text? Purification. The Old Testament ritual system, which is just kind of off. It's incomplete. Jesus is about to come and start his ministry that is going to complete it in its totality. He's going to fill these with water, which is what they would have filled it with, and then he's going to change it into what? Wine. Wine in the New Testament always represents one thing, the blood of Jesus. I'm here to complete what was not. I'm here to fulfill what is. I am here. I am and Jesus looks at these jars of purification, six of them, and says, fill them up. And they start working. Jesus doesn't do anything physically. What does Jesus say? Now take it and take it to the master. Now the, the, the master of the, the party, this is probably a guy they would have hired, right? Sort of a party planner kind of guy. And he would have. He would have gone to party after party, and he would make sure everything was good to go. The family had to pay and prepare for it. But he would run it. And so he gets it, right? And he takes it and does, ah, what's that box of wine kind of stuff? Is that what he says? No. No, in fact, he does quite the opposite. In verse 10, he's like, whoa! That's literally the best wine I've had today. In fact, I would even argue, maybe the best wine he'd ever He's like, what's going on with this? We usually put that stuff up front. And what happens is what Jesus did in just a nanosecond. How long would that have taken normally? Natural processes? How long? And I don't know. My, I know my last name's Vineyard, but I have no idea how do you make wine. I, 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 it, would, it would take days and weeks and maybe years in order to get this wine that Jesus said is. It's almost pointing back to John chapter 1, which points back to Genesis chapter 1, because in the beginning, God did what would, what would take years and decades and millenniums and eons, and he spoke, and it was. And in John 1, John the Apostle writes, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he spoke, and it was. And in John 2, he intends, and it's there. Do you know God can do that for you? He can take what would take years and decades and do, done, complete, fulfilled, whole. Because you all have problems that are outside of you. But you could take them to him. And in the text, the macro problem is we ran out of wine. And so Mary's like, fix this. And he said, pour it. And it was. Some of us have problems that require outside help. They had problems 
that required outside help. We don't realize that until the party stops, right? Life's a party until it stops, right? We don't realize it until something stops the party because we're just living our life, doing our party thing, and all of a sudden something happens and there's a medical thing or a family thing or oh, pick your thing and something happens and it's right in front of us. We're like, oh, the party has stopped. Sometimes that's a divine thing to say, look to me. Look outside of yourself. We, we, we're, we're good Americans that like to look at ourselves and fix it ourselves. And God said, that's not how I made you. I made you to look to me. And so the macro, the micro principle is sometimes there's problems that require outside help. They look to Jesus and he fixed it. That is also the macro principle in the book of John, the big picture principle. And what do I mean by that? Well, he gives you a hint in verse 11. In verse 11, he says this. This is the first of his signs. Let me just pause. What does that imply? When it says, this is the first of his signs, what does that imply? There's, there's more. Okay, it's the first. So the implication is there's more. Well, how would you know it? Well, you would just read, right? Because John, the apostle, who, oh, by the way, was there. He was there and witnessed this. John witnessed this, and then I would argue probably 60, 70 years later penned this book. He was a very old man probably when he wrote the book of John. He writes, this is the first of his signs. Well, if you read the book of John, the structure of the book is this. There are seven signs that I'm going to show you. Oh, wait a minute. If I'm from a Jewish background, what's that number? I'm going to show you the completeness and the totality of the divinity of Jesus. And I'm going to choose seven as a sampling, as a representative number, to show you how awesome and amazing he is. Here's seven signs. I'll give them to you very quickly. Just if you're interested, you write them down, you look at them yourself. But the sign number one... Is, is here. Sign number two is chapter four, the healing of an official son. The next sign, when he makes the lame man walk, chapter five. When he feeds the 5,000 and walks on water, both in chapter six. When he brings sight to the blame, blind man in chapter nine, and then the seventh and the coup de grace in chapter 11, literally the raising of a dead man named Lazarus. And here are seven signs that I'm going to show you, says John, for a purpose. Now, what would be the purpose? The purpose is embedded in the word. John could have said, hey, there's seven miracles I want you to see. He doesn't call them a miracle. He does it in the book. He calls it a what? Sign. What is the purpose of a sign? And let me just give it to you. This, a sign's purpose is an indicator for action. You see a road sign? The road sign is not merely about the road sign. This is a road sign. Like, that's not helpful, right? That's not useful at all. The road sign has information so you can act. So when I tell my daughter, Kate, there's a sign that says, slow down on the road. What does that imply? <laughs> not that you have a problem. <laughs> When the sign says slow down and there's a zigzag, it's giving you the information so that you can act. That's, that's the purpose. It's an indicator for action. You're going to need to do something. So I'm giving you a sign so that you can do it. We see in the text what the purpose was. What happens after he says it? Look at verse 11. Again. This is the first of his signs that Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. Indicator for what? For action. What's the rest of the verse? And his disciples believed. The sign has a purpose. Yes, Jesus helped them out, right? Jesus helped them out, and that was a good thing, but that's not the macro purpose of it. The macro purpose of the micro event is this. I'm going to do it, and you're going to see it, and you're going to believe. That's the purpose. The purpose of the sign was so that you might believe. 
when you jump to the back of the book of John, that's what he said the purpose of all Jesus' signs were. John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. John is one of the only books in the Bible that explicitly says this is why it's written. There's other books of the Bible. We can infer why it's written. We can surmise why it's written. We understand. John tells you the reason I'm writing this gospel is for this reason. He doesn't give you a bottom line up front. He gives you a bottom line in the back. In the back of his book, this is what he says. Now, Jesus did many other, let's say it, signs. He, he already warned you, right? In chapter 2, he said, this is the first. At the very end, he said what? Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Let me pause there. John is telling you, there's more. But what I'm giving you is enough. Jesus did so much more. He'll, he'll go on to say, I suppose that all the books in the world wouldn't have enough to fill what he did. He says, but check this out. This is enough. I'm giving you seven representative samples of the miracles of Jesus. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. John chapter 2, sign, belief. John chapter 20, what does Jesus say? I'm giving you signs. Why? So that you might believe. And that when you believe, you might have life in your name because correct belief is followed by true life. Transformative life. Christianity is not an intellectual exercise. It's not just believe in here because you've got this and you're good to go. It's transformative. It involves the mind, but it's holistic. It involves the heart, the cardia, according to the Greeks, the, 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 the heart, the, the seat of will, the seat of intention, the seat of thinking. It involves the hands and the feet. You see, you can't be a Christian just in here. It's not possible. You're a Christian here or you're not a Christian How do you know that? You know that because the very next chapter of the book of John, John chapter 3, Jesus has a conversation. He's out. He's out. He's out in the open now. John 2, the miracle happens, the word spreads. This guy. This guy. John 3, an older man approaches Jesus. A religiously serious but spiritually lost man. I want you to hear how I, I worded that, because I purposely worded that. His name's Nicodemus. Religiously serious. This man is serious about his faith. The problem is he's totally lost. And he comes to Jesus at night. Now, I would argue Nicodemus knows the Old Testament better than anybody in this room. Better than me. He knew what it said all day long. He just didn't know Jesus. He didn't know what it meant. The Pharisees, we like to like hammer them. Oh, those schmoes. They loved the word of God. They knew exactly what it said. They just didn't know what it meant. And Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night because he don't want his other buddies to know he's there. And Jesus, and you read it for yourself, tells Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus says, what? I, I, I just, you just think, no, not physically. Spiritually. And then the most famous verse of all time. What's the most famous verse of all time? John 3, 16. It is. I looked it up a, a while back. It's literally the most searched verse on the internet. I don't know. People have tracked that. There was a couple years ago they tracked it, and it was like 2.1 million hits a month on this one search engine for John 3.16. 
John 3.16 is an addendum, an extra adding that John writes. I don't think Jesus said, but it's from God. John, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and he says, you must be born again. And then John adds, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever, what? Believes in him. Receive eternal life. There it is again. John 2, believe. John 20, believe. John 3, believe. The whole book of John is about believe. And if you believe, guess what? You'll receive eternal life. You'll be transformed. You'll receive the Holy Spirit. You'll be forgiven. You'll be justified. The sanctification process will begin. You'll be adopted. All of this happens in a nanosecond. Just like in the beginning. In a nanosecond. Because of the intention and the love and the goodness of the great God who reigns over everything. When you believe, you will receive a reception that looks different than the world. A few years ago, I, I read a story about a pastor, a famous, guy, famous pastor from Los Angeles. And he was confronted by a famous agnostic, someone who doesn't believe, a skeptic. The agnostic came and, and confronted the pastor and said, I want to challenge you to a debate. Televised. I want it on TV. I want everybody to see it. And it's about who Jesus is. He's like, I will disprove this Jesus fellow. I want to talk God, I want to talk Jesus, and why it's garbage. <laughs> pastor's like, oh, okay, right? So the pastor stood there for a minute and said, you know what? I will accept on one condition. He said, my condition is this. If you bring one person that agnosticism has transformed their life for the good, I will bring 100 whom Christ has transformed their life for the good. And if you bring two, I'll bring 200. If you bring three, I'll bring 300. But you have to bring at least one where your lack of faith in anything has transformed their life. He did it in about face and he walked away. When you believe in agnosticism or atheism, whatever, you receive nothing because it is nothing. When you believe in Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, your life is transformed from the inside out. And it's been the same the generation before, and the generation before, and the generation before, until the beginning. Verse 11, his disciples believed. There's the point. There's the point. Some problems require outside help. Two applications and we're done. And I've already given them to you. Application number one, macro application. You have a salvation problem that can't get fixed on your own. You are separated from God until you're not. None of us are born knowing God. We are born apart from God. Reference Genesis 3. The sin separates us, distorts the world, makes it... Everybody knows deep in their heart in this world, something is wrong here. It is. It's called you. <laughs> it's called me. It's called sin. And if we stay separated from God, we'll continue in that separation for eternity. That's called hell. And we'll feel it until we get there. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, while we were in that mess, Jesus came and said, I didn't mean it to be this way. I'm going to bridge the gap between you and God, and I'll bring you together. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. See, you can be super religious and be totally lost. Reference Nicodemus, John chapter 3. Totally lost. I can quote you the scripture and I don't know Jesus. 
then you're hell bound because you should be. Until he comes in and transforms you like you ought to be. And he bridges the gap. And, and changes the heart. God has put eternity in our heart. Ecclesiastes. And it's not going to be filled until that eternity sized hole is through Christ. Have you done that? You've got a problem. He's got the solution. You need to respond. That's the macro application today. Can I give you the micro? The micro application is this. What do you have going on in your life? Because so many of you probably are Christians. Awesome. But we still have problems. <laughs> Bring them to him. Bring them to him. Some of you have problems that others know about. Some of you have problems that others don't know about. It doesn't matter. Bring them to him. He cares. They, they had a, a wine problem. <laughs> they brought it to him. Now, here's the thing, and we know this. We don't always get the answer we want, right? And that's true. We don't always get the answer we want. But when we bring our problems to him, we are guaranteed to get the care, compassion, mercy, and grace that we need. And I want you to hear that. We may not get the answer we want, but we'll get the response that we need from the loving Father. And that can be super, super comforting, even though I still have a coolant problem, or a that kind of problem, or a this kind of problem. Because there is a God who's living, who cares, who says, come, ask, seek, and knock, and I will answer. Let's pray. Father God, I'm grateful for your word, which is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. Lord, I don't know what's going on in the hearts and minds of everyone today, but I know one who does. It's the one Mary went to. That's you. And Father, I pray now that if there's someone here who doesn't know you, who, who may know about you, or, or may, may not, may, may not have grown up in church or chapel, and maybe today is the day of salvation, and that today is the day that they would bend the knee of the heart and say yes. For those who are believers in this room, thank you. I pray that you'd remind us we can bring anything to you. And really, we should bring everything to you. I pray you just move in our hearts right now. Ultimately, for our good and for your glory. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. Let's stand and sing our last song together.
No scheme of hell, no scoffer's crown, no burden great can hold you down in strength. You reign forever, let your church proclaim. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with him again. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Oh, death, where is your sting? And oh, hell, where is your victory? Church, come stand in the light of glory of God has defeated the night. Sing it, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, hell, where is your victory? And oh, church, come stand in the light of God. He's not dead, he's alive, he's alive. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with him again. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Thank you again for worshiping with us today. Uh, it's been a joy to be able to open God's Word and, and hopefully challenge you as I, as I challenge myself. Um, I, I, I'll tell you a, a glimpse of the, the future here. Chaplain McLean and I have been, been scheming. Starting in October, we're going to walk through the book of Philippians. All right, so we're going to do that out the first Sunday of October, take about two months. We're going to walk through it. Lord willing, next week we're going to give you guys the read ahead. All right, we're going to show you this is where we're going, have some memory verses with it, which will bring us into Advent. So super excited about that. Uh, more to follow, but uh, receive the benediction, and uh, then let's go from this place. The Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And everybody said? Amen. All right, you're released. There's donuts back there for fellowship. If you want to chat, pray, I'll be up here for a couple minutes. God bless. Some glad morning when this life is over, I fly away. Yeah.
by a song is from there. 